on America's Most Wanted, Gina and Amanda had both been featured on there. Their disappearances had been linked on TV and they were they were there together. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpot, this is Sandy, and I cover true crime cases on my channel. This case, <sighs> this is the type of case that honestly made me want to start a YouTube channel because it just shows you that it's not the end. If somebody goes missing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll never see them again. There is hope and I would hope that it instills that hope in people who have had loved ones go missing. Also, I do just want to put a disclaimer out there. Any information I provide is based off articles, interviews, and accounts from the people that are involved in the case. And this video is basically just what I have summarized from all of that into the one source. I also want to thank Jeannie for this request, so thank you so much for requesting this case. And to anyone else who has sent in requests over the last week or two. I know a lot have come in in that time frame so I, I just hope that you can be patient with me because obviously I only upload twice a month so the fact that there's like a good few requests there even if no more came in it would take me like months to get through them all and so that's not me saying I never will it's just simply it might take me a while to get to it. So let's get into today's video. This is the case of Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry and Gina De Jesus, otherwise known as the Cleveland abduction case. So starting with Michelle Knight, she was born in April 1981 and she grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And as a young girl she wanted to be a firefighter but then later on she wanted to become a vet. And she did also grow up with some developmental delays which in turn affected her height. So she was only four foot seven when she was fully grown if you will and she did get bullied in school for this both verbally and on occasion physically. Now Michelle did drop out of high school because she became pregnant so she went on to have a little boy called Joey but when Joey was a toddler he sustained some kind of injury and this injury was as a result of an abusive boyfriend whether that have been Michelle's abusive boyfriend or her mother's abusive boyfriend, it's kind of unclear. But unfortunately, because of this injury he sustained, she actually had to give him up to Child Protective Services and little Joey was put into foster care. So on the 23rd of August 2002, when Michelle was 21 years old, she was at her cousin's house before heading off to court because she actually had a custody hearing that day. And she was late to court and she was really flustered, but this would unfortunately be the day that she would go missing and she wouldn't be seen for 11 years. And obviously, after she went missing, her family reported her missing, but because Joey had been taken away from her and that whole thing was going on, they kind of believed that maybe she just ran away and went off to start a new life, start fresh, because she was in so much pain over what happened with Joey. Her mother would hand out flyers about Michelle and everything, but in 2003, 15 months after she went missing, she was actually taken off the FBI missing person database because it was widely believed that she just left. Okay, moving on to Amanda Berry. Amanda Berry was born in April of 1986 and she actually worked in one of the Burger Kings in Cleveland. So the day before Amanda's 17th birthday, she actually was working a shift in Burger King and she had gone back and forth and back and forth over whether or not she should even do this shift. She was like, well, will I take it off because it's my birthday the next day? Uh, but she ended up going and doing the shift. But this would lead to a very unfortunate and honestly life-changing turn of events because at the end of her shift that day, the shift that she nearly took off, Amanda disappeared. She texted her sister around 8 p.m. saying that she was getting a lift home, but she never arrived home. But around a week after she disappeared, Amanda's mother got a phone call from an unidentified male saying, I have Amanda, she's fine and she'll be coming home in a few days. But in case you didn't guess, this certainly did not happen. Okay, and on to Gina De Jesus. Gina was born in April 1990 and was also from Cleveland, Ohio, and she came from a really tight-knit close family. She went to Wilbur Wright Middle School and she would walk there and back every day and this was about a 40 block walk so it was 
like a decent walk. But in April 2004, actually the day after her 14th birthday, Gina de Jesus disappeared while she was walking home from school. And what's mad about this is Gina's mother had actually given her 125 to get the bus home. But she decided not to do that and actually to walk because then she could use that money for gum and snacks. Around 3 p.m. she was seen at a payphone with her friend Arlene Castro and they were trying to organize a sleepover that night. So Arlene was asking her mother, would she be allowed to sleep over? And she ended up not being allowed, so they ended up walking their separate ways. And Arlene Castro would be the last person to see her because she didn't arrive home that day. And Gina's family were amazing working with the police, getting flyers out there and like they did so much because they genuinely believed that Gina was out there and that they would have her home that day. Like I really did a inspiring job of keeping that hope alive. Also in 2004, 2005 and 2006, Gina was featured on America's Most Wanted. And in one of these episodes, her disappearance was actually linked to Amanda Berry. Also about a year after Gina disappeared, a composite sketch came out from the FBI. They described a Latino man between 25 and 35 years old, five foot 10, between 165 to 185 pounds, with green eyes, a goatee and possibly a pencil thin beard. But this didn't exactly do a whole lot. But okay, let's regroup and see where we're at. So there was clearly something sketchy going on here. We've got three young girls going missing from the same area in Cleveland. In fact, two of these girls went missing from the exact same street. So let's flip it over to see what was going on from the girl's point of view. The first girl to go missing, Michelle Knight, had been approached by a vehicle on Lorraine Avenue and she was offered a lift by a man called Ariel Castro. And Michelle actually knew one of this man's daughters, so she accepted the lift. But almost instantly after she got in the car, he did this like massive spin around the car park. <laughs> she was looking at him like, dude, like, really? Like what, what you doing? And his response was, oh, my kids love that. So this was a little weird, but Michelle just kind of shrugged it off and excused it and was like, you know, maybe he just genuinely likes to do that, whatever. Although she did also notice that there was no door handle on her side. And while they were driving, Ariel brought up the fact that he had puppies he was trying to find a home for. And Michelle was thinking, oh, my son loves puppies. So he offered one to her, he said, well, you can come by the house and see them if you want. So she accepted and she agreed to go with him to his home at 2207 Seymour Avenue. <sighs> but this would be the beginning of Michelle's worst nightmare because as soon as she stepped inside the door, she was restrained and imprisoned. Which leads me on to Amanda Berry. Amanda, as we know, was last heard from at 8 p.m. the night of her shift at Burger King. And she was trying to get a lift from a family member, but she couldn't get through. So she said, oh, do you know what? I'll just start walking. But then a vehicle pulls in and the man offers her a lift. And this man was, of course, Ariel Castro. But Amanda actually knew his daughter and obviously Ariel knew this as well. So he offered for her to come visit his daughter in his home. So she accepted the lift and agreed to go to his house. Now, when they got into the house, the bathroom door was shut. So Ariel said, oh, I guess my daughter's taking a bath. But following this, he took her into a closet and he raped her. I can, I cannot even imagine how terrified you would be. Moving on to Gina's kidnapping. On that day when Gina was walking home from school, she was approached by none other than Ariel Castro. And I don't know if you've put two and two together, but Arlene Castro was the friend that Gina was trying to get to sleep over in her house. Ariel Castro was her father. But anyway, Ariel obviously knew that Arlene and Gina were friends. And Ariel asked her, could you help me look for my daughter? So, I mean, Gina had literally just been with her at the payphone. So she said, yeah and she got in the car and they drove away. Ariel brought her to his home and of course, restrained and imprisoned her. In 2004, Ariel's estranged son, Anthony, who was a journalism student, 
actually wrote an article about the disappearance of Gina de Jesus. He even interviewed Gina's mother. Little did he know that Gina, the person he was writing about, was in his father's house. Oh my god. Now, before we move on, let me just remind you of that FBI composite sketch that I told you about earlier. I mean, this was a pretty spot on description of Ariel Castro. Let's find out a bit more about him. So Ariel Castro was born in 1960 in Puerto Rico and his parents divorced when he was a child. So when that happened, he, his mother, and three of his siblings moved to the US. In 1992, he moved in with his girlfriend, Gramilda Figueroa, if I've pronounced that correctly. <laughs> but apparently once they moved in, it was just a nightmare. Ariel had beaten Gramilda regularly, breaking several of her bones, including her nose, her skull, her ribs, and her arms. And one of these breaks actually caused a clot in her brain which went on to cause an inoperable tumor, which went on to cause her death. He was arrested for domestic violence on one occasion, but he got off because of a technicality. But luckily though, just four years after they moved in together, Grimelda was like, mm -mm, I'm out. So she left and she took the kids with her and she got custody of the kids. So uh, this guy was just bad news. like. Seriously bad news. Now, Ariel had also been a school bus driver, which was another reason why Michelle, Amanda, and Gina were aware of him, but he was fired for bad judgment. And I mean, I was like, what does that even mean in a literal sense? But some of the things he did were use the bus to go grocery shopping. And he, <laughs> he went on his lunch break, leaving a child on the bus. But trust me, we have only heard the tip of the iceberg so far. So let's get into what it was like in captivity and what that entailed for the girls. I will warn you though, this is where things get very disturbing. And when I say that, what I'm talking about is physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, and even animal abuse. So just try and mentally prepare for that if possible. Okay, so starting from the beginning, when Michelle was originally kidnapped, and she was brought in, restrained, and imprisoned. Ariel left her for three days without food. Her hands and feet were also tied together so she couldn't move. And while she was there, she was raped many times. And Michelle actually became pregnant five times during her captivity. And she miscarried all five of these pregnancies because she was so badly beaten and so badly malnourished. When I say beaten, this is what I mean. Ariel would punch her, hit her with dumbbells, slam her against walls, and of course, starve her. In fact, she was beaten so bad that she actually lost hearing in one of her ears. And she even required facial reconstruction surgery. At one point though, Michelle had a pet dog in captivity, which was like this one companion, like this one thing that she could get love and affection from. Mm. Ariel killed this dog, in fact, the dog was literally trying to protect Michelle. So he bit Ariel. Of course, Ariel got bitten by this dog and snapped its neck. Now, when Amanda was brought into the house at first, just after Ariel raped her that first time, he chained her to a radiator with just a five foot chain and it was really tight around her waist. He also taped up her ankles and put a helmet over her head. He told her that if she was good, that he would take her home. But I think she knew that that was not gonna be the case. Amanda would be raped up to five times a day on occasion. And on that note, one day, about three years into her captivity, she realized that she was late on her period. Amanda was pregnant. But Amanda actually stayed pregnant for the full nine months and she actually had a baby, a healthy baby. But obviously Ariel Castro wasn't gonna bring Amanda to a hospital or anything. So she had to just do it there. She had to give birth in his home with no medical support. Forget about epidural or painkillers or gas and air, forget about all that. It was just like, focus on staying alive and keeping your baby alive. So she was put into a small inflatable swimming pool and Michelle was taken in and commanded to help. And apparently Ariel literally threatened Michelle and said, 
if this baby doesn't survive, I'm gonna kill you. And actually at one point the baby stopped breathing, but Michelle was somehow able to resuscitate her. Luckily though, in the end, Amanda gave birth to a beautiful, healthy young girl and she named her Jocelyn. Side note though, since all this has happened, there have been reports that have come out suggesting that it is possible that there were more pregnancies than what we know of and that maybe they miscarried either before they knew about it or whatever, like there may have been more miscarriages. While the girls were in captivity, they were actually able to watch TV sometimes and they literally watched their own segments on the news and on America's Most Wanted. Gina and Amanda had both been featured on there. Their disappearances had been linked on TV and they were they were there together. But there was another show that basically a self-proclaimed psychic called Sylvia Brown was speaking to Amanda's mother and Amanda was watching this on TV. What this psychic told her would just break her heart. So Sylvia told Amanda's mother that she believed Amanda was dead and in water. <laughs> Knowing that she wasn't, it's like, seriously, what gives you the right to say that to the mother of a missing girl? So naturally this broke Amanda's mother's heart, like totally broke her heart. She took down pictures of Amanda around the house, she gave away Amanda's computer, she just believed within herself that Amanda was never going to come home. And it wasn't even long after that until Amanda's mother passed away. And it is said that she passed away of a broken heart. Really interesting because it was about nine months later, on the 25th of December 2006, that Amanda gave birth to Jocelyn. So I'm not sure if she knew at the time that her mother was dead, but either during or after it, I'm not altogether sure, she believed that Jocelyn was a gift from her mother. But Jocelyn more or less lived in captivity with them all as well. I mean, Ariel did love her and he would occasionally bring her out of the house and stuff, but for the most part, Jocelyn lived in captivity with the girls as well. One of the places though that he would bring her is to visit his mother, which I find really interesting because I'm like, what? did this mother like question this? Like, <sighs> Would she not be like, uh, dude, where is this baby coming from? But I suppose he and his wife weren't together anymore, so he might have just said that it was like an out of wedlock child or whatever, but I, like, I don't actually know the details, but I find that really strange. And although Jocelyn's father was an absolute piece of shit, <laughs> she was really incredibly lucky with her mother. Amanda was so amazing with her, like she created this school basically he would pretend walk to school yeah um i try to make it as real as possible for her you know so we would lock the door and we would walk to school and we would finally get to school and i would sit her down and tell her okay i love you have a good day and then i would become her teacher <laughs> she would teach her how to read and write and put the alphabet up on the wall and because obviously Ariel wasn't going to send Jocelyn to um, an official school because like <laughs> people would ask questions, it's way too risky and I'm guessing you need some kind of documentation for the child, like this child obviously didn't have a birth cert or anything. But as Jocelyn was growing up a little bit, she <laughs> naturally started to ask more questions as children do. like yo, dad, why is mommy in chains? Obviously, after a while, Ariel was like, there's not really a good explanation I can give to this child as to why her mother is in chains and not allowed to go out. Like, she's allowed to go out, but her mother isn't. Like, what's that about? So he actually ended up letting Amanda out of her chains. And just a little bit more about Gina when she was taken into the house. Ariel held her in the basement with ropes and chains alternatively and he actually put a bag over her head when he raped her because he knew her family and you know it felt wrong i don't exactly know what's worse to be honest like maybe you wouldn't even want to see it's just it just adds another layer of disrespect and dehumanization 
but when Gina got in there she would scream and cry a lot basically to try and attract some kind of attention but Ariel just had this whole situation sus like he would always play music really really loud and no one would be any wiser. The girls though, mainly Amanda, kept diaries while they were in there and in these diaries they spoke about forced sexual behaviour, being locked in a dark room, being in fear constantly of the next session of abuse but they would also write about their dreams like dreaming about freedom dreaming about reuniting with their family someday so at one point ariel had been out of the house and he ran into none other than gina's mother she was handing out flyers to try and raise awareness for her missing daughter gina ariel took one of the flyers like Oh yeah, I'll keep an eye out. Oh, thanks for your doing a great job. Oh my God. So he took this flyer back home and he showed it to Gina. And he said, oh yeah, I ran into your mom. You haven't seen your mother in years and you're happy that she's looking for you, but the person that took you has just spoken to her and taken something physical off her. But Gina held on to this flyer. She knew that her own mother had been holding this very piece of paper. And all the while, the girls were only blocks away from their respective homes. And of course, living with such frequent abuse, they kind of learned over time that when they screamed and when they cried and showed their pain, Ariel got a kick from that. Like it gave him a boost. So they ended up learning not to do that. that like that in itself is a whole other pain, not lashing out in anger at this person. Also during their time there, they were forced to use plastic toilets, which were apparently emptied infrequently. They were fed on average one meal a day and they were allowed to shower max once or twice a week. The girls also didn't really get along that well while they were there because <laughs> Ariel would just pin them against each other. He would provide one of them with food and not the others and he would create this competition and tension and just, and like jealousy between them. So they didn't actually get along that well with it while they were in there, which honestly really surprised me when I first heard that because they're in it together kind of thing. But I can totally see how he just manipulated the situation, maybe to make sure that they didn't kind of come together and gang up against him. And another conversation Ariel had had with Anthony, his journalist son, he was asking him about Amanda Berry. Yeah, Ariel was asking Anthony about Amanda Berry. Basically asking, do you think she'll ever be found? And Anthony said, no, she's likely dead. So Ariel was like, really, do you think so? But at one point, Anthony had also reported that there were some areas in the house that were locked and inaccessible. <sighs> The fact that other people were in the house when there were three, really four, girls being held captive. <sighs> but then finally, <laughs> something amazing happened on the 6th of May 2013. Bear in mind by this time, Michelle Knight had been in there for 11 years. Amanda Berry had been in there for 10 years and Gina De Jesus had been in there for nine years. Seeing as Jocelyn was not held in chains and she was allowed to go downstairs or whatever, she was, that's what she was doing that day. And she came upstairs and says to Amanda, mommy, like daddy's car is gone. And considering the fact that Amanda was out of her chains at this point, probably recently so, Amanda was thinking, okay, it's now or never. If I'm gonna do this, I have to do it right now. I do not have time to be wasting. And Amanda managed to get to the front door and she opened it, but there was a storm door, like a screen door kind of thing, which was locked and it was padlocked. So there was like a hole or some kind of opening. It was about this big and she could fit her arm through. So she was waving her arm around, screaming, trying to get someone's attention. And this is when she got a neighbor's attention by the way a legend neighbor's attention like there would have been a legend anyway for doing what happened next but like just <laughs> just wait till you see this guy is just amazing he's a neighbor uh t walk me through again what happened this afternoon you were you, you heard screaming heard screaming 
I meet my McDonald's. I uh, come outside. I see this girl going nuts, trying to get out of her house. I go on the porch, and she says, "Help me get out." I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time. So we kick the bottom, and she comes out with the little girl, and she says, "Call 911." My name was Amanda Berry. Yeah, I'm like, I'm calling the 911 for Amanda Berry. I thought this girl was dead. You know what I mean? And and she got on the phone and she said, yes, this is me. See, the girl Amanda told the police, I ain't just the only ones. It's some more girls up in that house. And like I say, my neighbor, uh, you, you got you got the, some big testicles to pull this off, bro. Because we see this dude every day. I mean, every day. How long have you lived here? I've been here a year. Okay. You sure coming from? Right. I, Barbecue with, with this dude. We eat ribs and, and whatnot and listen to salsa music. You see I'm coming from? Because I can't imagine to see the sunlight to be Bro, around. People. I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. Dead Charles, giveaway. Charles, thank you very Dead much. Dead giveaway. So they kicked a hole through the bottom of the screen door and Amanda crawled through with her now six year old daughter. And she went with him to call 911. Barry. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm, I'm here. I'm free now. Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. So it wasn't long until the police officers arrived on the scene and went into the house and performed more of a search because the other two girls were still in there. They were too afraid to come out because they didn't believe it was possible. But Michelle Knight jumped into one of the officer's arms and she said, you saved me, you saved me. And just after this, Gina emerged from one of the other rooms and again, just like could not believe that this was happening. So for the whole community, this was just a moment of Wow. I mean, for Michelle, people thought that she was off living her own life. People didn't even, she wasn't even on the missing person database anymore. She was presumed a runaway and she had been living this hell of a life. So these girls could finally reunite with their families and have the freedom to do the little things that you or I might take for granted. And in more good news, Ariel Castro was arrested that same day, thank. God. And when he was interviewed, he remembered the kidnappings in insane detail and he explained that they were just crimes of opportunity. He also explained that he never really had an exit plan. I don't personally believe that he ever wanted to actually kill them because, I mean, I don't know, I haven't spoken to him personally, but it seems that way. Like if he was going to kill them, wouldn't he have just done it earlier? Like he, as disgusting as it is, he wanted to use those girls for sex. And it it would have been too messy to have to like hide a body and clean up after a murder. I, I don't think it was ever intended to go that way. I mean, you, j you don't know with people like this though. This was obviously a fucked up guy. I mean, I'm babbling on here, but he believed he was gonna be caught one day. What's interesting then is when his home was searched, they actually found a suicide note from him. And in this note, he spoke about the abductions and if he was caught or if he, you know, ended his life that his possessions should go to them. So Ariel Castro's charges then came to, who, 977 counts. This is how messed up this guy was. So within this 977, this included 512 counts of kidnapping, 446 counts of rape, seven counts of gross sexual imposition, six counts of felonious assault, three counts of child endangerment, two counts of aggravated murder, and this is for the role he played in Michelle's miscarriages and one count of possession of criminal tools. So in July 2013 then, Ariel agreed to a plea deal. And basically he and his lawyers were trying to stay as far away from the death penalty as possible, so that's where that came from. And when he spoke to the court, he claimed that he was not a monster, but that he was just addicted to sex. I just want to clear the record that I am not a monster. I did not prey on these women. I just acted on my sexual instincts because of my uh, sexual addiction. But he was sentenced to life in prison without parole, plus an additional thousand years. So this dude 
Like, there was no chance. Like, he was spending the rest of his days in prison. But, <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna say it. Uh, a month after Ariel's sentencing, he took his own life in his cell. <laughs> the fact that he held three women captive for 10 years and took 10 years of their lives away from them, as well as the first few very important developmental years of his daughter's life, and he couldn't handle more than a month in imprisonment. That... I... Okay, sorry, like I actually don't even know what to say about that. With everything he did to those girls, not just holding them captive, but pinning them against each other, sexual violence, physical abuse, th throwing dumbbells at women, starving them, and he couldn't just sit in a cell for more than a month. Even if he served his full sentence, like right up until the point where he died of natural causes or whatever, that still wouldn't have been enough. So the fact that he sat in a cell for a fucking month and decided, yeah, this is not for me, bye, I'm out. Like, anyway, onto a lighter note. Um, Let's see what the girls are up to now. So starting with Michelle, obviously you can't go through 10 years of several types of abuse without there being long-term effects. Due to years of being locked in a dark room, her sight is pretty weak. Her stomach is permanently damaged from the malnourishment, infections, the beatings. She has psychological issues and trust issues. And I believe she spends a lot of time on her own these days, but I also saw that she got married in 2016. So like she is just, <laughs> I just, oh my God, I'm so happy for her. After all of this, her heart was still open for love, which is just so incredible. She has gone on to write a book about her experience in captivity and then a book about life after that. And in the first book about her captivity, she, she tries to show people that you can get through hard times. Comparing my hard times to her hard times, I'm like, mine don't even count. Like, forget mine, they're nothing. Like, I, oh wow. And Gina and Amanda have also written a memoir together called Hope, and I believe it's in a lot of detail. And nowadays Amanda's working towards spreading awareness for more missing people, which is just like amazing. And I believe Gina is doing something similar as well. When you um, engaged a lawyer, and he asked you if you wanted anything. You just said you wanted two things. What were they? Uh, a tombstone, a headstone for my mom because she hadn't had one. And um, a birth certificate for my daughter. Last year, actually, Amanda and Charles Ramsey, the guy who set her free, basically, finally reunited after years. Hello! My baby. How are you? Oh, it's God. cold. Come on, get in here. Bam, bam, bam. Now, that got my attention. I said, it's a white girl over there, man. Y'all not gonna help her? Oh, I got a Big Mac in my hand, so I, I was I was on my way to get you, but remember, I got a Big Mac in my hand, so uh, give me time. So you never, nobody, like, I know, gosh, so I know she would cry, and he would have to turn the music up at like two or three in the morning. Did you ever hear a baby cry? And when I was telling people that, since I had no proof, I said, man, I'm telling you, man, I'm hearing a child cry. I'm hearing, and I ain't just hearing no baby. I'm hearing grown folks to get y'all out that house. Ain't no other way to look at that. I believe it because we were there for, I was there for 10 years. And I always wondered, when would I, when would I come home? You understand, baby? And if it wasn't for you, I don't know if I would still be home. So, you don't have to worry about nothing. I told you, I got you. But thank you. Thank you for coming that day. I love it's you. It's a symbol of, when you open it, you'll see. It's a little token of the time. It's a kind of like the time you gave back to me, my life. To this is the LeBron that. James stuff right here, babe. You Every know. time you look at it, you think of us and what you, you know did. It that day, because you're my hero. Oh. 
So. Girl, come here. I just want to say God bless you. Oh, I love you. Yeah. Hello, it's Editing Kate here. I just have, oh my God, I cannot believe I'm only finding this out now. I've just found information that says Ariel Castro's daughter is in prison for 25 years for graphic warning here slashing her baby's throat. I don't know how I haven't seen this anywhere else, but it just came up when I was getting pictures for this video. It's not the daughter that Gina was friends with. It was another one called Emily, but yeah, that's the update on that. So that brings me to the end of this case. I'm so glad that this had a happy ending. And again, it's just so incredible, despite everything these girls went through that there is actually a happy ending to this story. And now they get to go out and live real lives as real people and feel like a valued human being again. It just really puts things into perspective that, you know, there are so many things that people complain about, especially in 2020, and I'm not saying it's not warranted, but most of us are just so much stronger than we realize. They got out, their nightmare came to a close. So if you're going through a rough time right now, know that your nightmare can end too. So before I start crying, <laughs> thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, please leave a like and comment down below what your thoughts were. Also, if you've come this far and you haven't subscribed, I mean, help a girl out, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. My Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all katephilpot underscore YT. And I do actually post a lot more true crime content on TikTok nowadays, so go ahead and follow me on there. But anyway, thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.